You know I'm right. The podcast that uncovers the origin stories of some of the biggest names in media, sports, entertainment, comedy, and so much more. Nick Durst here along with Joe Calvary's Joe. You know, in baseball, they got the five to a player. Our guest today, he's definitely a five to a player. Radio, comedy, acting. He's a writer. He does it all. Tell everybody who we have with us. Absolutely. He, a uh, longtime radio host here in New York in the morning show. Uh, I grew up listening to him uh, with Baltazar and our guest. Uh, his name, John Siliano, uh, Siliano, right? Saliano. So, uh, Saliano. All right. I want to get that right as a paisan. Saliano and his name, Goomba Johnny. Baltazar and Goomba Johnny. Grew up watching you. Uh, we're very, very happy to have you on, Johnny. Welcome to the show. How you doing? Uh, Thank, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Well, Johnny, thanks for coming on with us. And, you know, the three of us, New Yorkers, you grew up in the Bronx. So obviously, Joe wanted to break out his Yankee shirt to impress you. But what was it like for you growing up in the Bronx? Did you really get into it with the Yankees? Uh, you know, what did you think of, of Arthur Avenue? Uh, obviously, the, mo- the movie based over there in Arthur Avenue. What, what was it like for you growing up in the Bronx? Well, I had a real... Uh storybook italian uh you know childhood i grew up in the same uh neighborhood i as my father i lived in the same building as my father grew up in i went to the same grammar school i went to holy rosary uh that my father went to and uh my father was a bronx detective uh uh for like over 27 years and um we stayed in Yonkers until I was like 11 or 12, and then we moved to Yonkers. Uh, but when we grew up in the Bronx, we had a building. It was 16 apartments, four-story walk-up. And out of the 16 apartments, 15 of the people were Italian. And I would come home from school. Every door would be open. We lived on the top floor, and I would walk up, and every level I got to, somebody would come out. Johnny boy, I want you to try this. I have meatballs. Come in, Johnny boy. Try this, Johnny boy. I, I made. I have some cookies. I made some cookies. By the time I got to my house, I already, I already ate a meal. It was a really wonderful, wonderful uh, upbringing. Uh, very, very different than what is going on today. Now let me ask you a question. You share the same name as your uncle, right? And your uncle served. If I'm not mistaken, my uncle who? Your uncle Johnny. You have a, do you have an uncle Johnny? I got it. Yeah, my uncle Johnny. Yeah, served, he served, right? I'm sorry to hear that. My apologies. Yeah, it was my godfather. And he served, right? He served. He was a Marine in uh, Korea uh, and um, very um, a decorated combat Marine. Uh, and um, he was a great guy. He was a New York City fireman for many, many years, too serving his city and his country. We love to hear that. Uh, so you attended uh, SUNY Brockport, right? Yeah, I did. Great. Tell us about that. Um, you know, it was good. I mean, I, I I probably would have never went to college at all if I didn't want to play football. Um, you know, I ended up with two degrees by accident. Uh I went to Westchester Community College first, and I got a degree in marketing, and I got a degree in science from uh, – uh, <clears throat> from from the four year college and um, you know I mean academically uh, you know I was uh, I was average and you know that I think that had a lot to do with you know what I put into it I wasn't really uh, I I wasn't inspired my pursuit of knowledge at the age was very weak it was all about football weightlifting and uh, you know hanging out you know I I I was a very very slow maturer you know my uh i think my 20s were were kind of like my teens you know so i was i my mother used to always tell me you're going to be a late bloomer (laughs) so yeah it was good i mean i had a great experience you know i mean it was state university um you know uh i had no idea how big and beautiful new york state was until i went up to brockport which was right in between Rochester and Buffalo. My roommates were from Rochester and Buffalo. I used to go to the Buffalo Bill games uh, with them. They were a huge Bill fan. I mean, it was amazing to me 
when I went to college and I met people that were actually Bill fans. You know what I mean? That was yeah, it kind of blew my mind because you know everything was Jet Giants, you know. Yeah. And then I'm like, these people are like diehard Bill fans, and uh, it was great. We used to go to Rich Stadium and and snow and everything. It was just fabulous up there. It was great. A lot of nice people. So what what position were you in football, and what was it like for you when you're able to sign with the Jets as a free agent and the and the Giants ultimately? You didn't work out for you, had the career ending injury, but talk to us about your time in the pros playing for um, well, you know, I went to college. I went to I played a division three ball. They told me that um I was the first person to sign a professional contract from the school, you know, back in nineteen seventy-nine. And in college, um uh they had me play defensive tackle. And then when I signed my contract with the Jets, I got switched to offensive lineman. And um one of the things about playing a lower level uh, brand of football is that when you get to the pro level, the speed of the game is so much different. I just remember the first time that we scrimmaged and the ball was hiked. And I just remember saying to myself, where did everybody go? You know what I mean? It was just like, <laughs> it was like instantaneous, you know? And um, it was, it was good. You know, it was good for me. I mean, um, uh, you know, my father was a real football fan. Uh, he loved it. He, he was a diehard Giant fan. And, um, you know, it was something that really, uh, uh, you know, I feel like he he was very proud of me. And, um, you know, it didn't work out for me. I got hurt. You know what I mean? And talent wise, I probably wasn't good enough to sustain a career in the NFL. But it was quite an accomplishment for me to to be able to wear both uniforms. And, um, you know, and to, you know, just see, see what it was like. So, uh, but it was a long time ago. Well, it was an accomplishment then. It's still an accomplishment, but an accomplishment in itself. Now, I want to talk to you because you, uh, what were you thinking career-wise? Um, like coming out of college and and kind of right after that, that time with the Giants and the Jets after your, your, your football aspirations kind of ended, uh, what were you really ultimately thinking as a career path? Where were you going to go? And um, you kind of bounced around here. You did a couple of different things. So I also want to talk about uh, creating Broadway bodyguards, right? Mm -hmm. Escorting celebrities and famous businessmen outside the New York city area. Uh, some celebrities include Smokey Robinson, uh, Sam Kinison, Malcolm Forbes, now, I have an uncle uh, who's actually from Florida. He used to drive for a private limousine company for a really, really long time. And he used to shuffle out high-level celebrities, high-level politicians, mm. and it's out of Midtown. So you guys could probably talk the same language yeah. uh, regarding the process of taking calls for certain people, the exclusivity, right? You know, what you can and can't do, you know, how you shuffle them in and out. Um, but yeah, so just talk to us about like, what were you thinking after football and how did Broadway body arts kind of get off the ground? Um, well, you know, obviously when I got out of, uh, you know, when I got done playing football, I was still pretty big. I was, you know, six foot one, I was about 265 pounds. So, you know, back in those days, uh, there weren't a lot of guys, my size, you know, I mean, now you see guys, 300 pounds, it's, it's pretty commonplace. Uh, but I was, uh, I got into competitive powerlifting. And I probably went up to one point, probably about 278 at that point. So um, I didn't really have a plan, to be honest with you. Uh, um, I never wanted to be a comedian. I never wanted to be on the radio. I never thought about it. Um, I was more of uh, uh, everything that happened to me was uh, God's blessings. It was destiny, very faithful. Um, I mean, I was managing a comedy club and comedians didn't show up one night and I had to go on stage, uh, you know, and introduce uh, another comedian. And that was the start of my comedy career. I bombed totally. I mean, I'd love to tell the story because, um, you know, all comedians go through this. It's baptism through fire and you go up there and you bomb. And what was interesting about bombing is that you, you you start sweating it turns on like a faucet when you're up there and the audience is just silent 
And I just remember saying to myself, I could feel the sweat running behind my ears. And I'm like, I had no idea. I didn't know I had sweat glands there. You know what I mean? And I could feel it going behind my knees. And it was hysterical. And I remember I just looked at the audience and I said, I know somebody out there might be struggling and considering about taking your life or whatever it is. Please don't do that. Just do five minutes of stand up. You'll have the same experience. <laughs> and you'll live to tell it. And they started laughing because they knew, you know, what I was feeling. And uh, even though I did so poorly, I, I got the bug and I and I felt that I could do it. And I was a manager of the club. And in order to get better acts, to have money for extra money for the headliners, I started to host the shows. And I would host the shows. Obviously, I didn't pay myself. And then I would have an extra three, four hundred dollars on the back end to get a better headliner. So I did that for a while and, um, you know, I stopped, you know, for a long time. And then when I got to KTU, I, I, I started up again. And, uh, it, you know, when I got to KTU, it was a different story. Um, you know, I would do a lot of two man shows with, um, you know, very, very big acts like, uh, you know, I worked with, you know, I opened up for Dice and Dom Herrera and Rich Jenny and, uh, you know, Jay Moore and Kevin Pollack and uh, I can go on and on, you know, and um, I started to work more regularly and and put together a, uh, a, a, you know, a much better act. And I got to watch, you know, the top comics, you know, perform. And the only way that you can get better in comedy is to get up there as much as you can. It's it's a it's repetition in comedy, performance, repetition in comedy. I think is is the is the key. So once you got established, then you started touring later on after the radio stuff as well. What cities became your favorite cities to go to? What were, what were the best venues? And then since you became an established name, did you have any sort of writer for your green room? Was there something you needed to have there for you? Oh yeah. Well, I'm I'm touring right now with Anthony Rodia for the past five years. And it's funny because um Many times um, we get comments from the people, whether it's casinos or theaters or comedy clubs. I have to tell you, you two guys are the most low maintenance comedians that ever came in here. And we go, what are you talking about? And they go, well, because we require water, club soda and Diet Coke. And that's it. You know what I mean? Other comedians, I mean, when I hear some of the stuff, the 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 alcohol and this and the food and all that other stuff, you know? So I tease Anthony. I said, you know what? I think we need to be more difficult. <laughs> so he got some like, pizza and cannolis in there. Yeah. <laughs> I said, we need to start ordering like some trout amandine, you know, some obscure dish, you know, or something like that. But um, uh, I remember, um, you know, I did some security work for bands and, uh, and Van Halen, uh, I worked for Van Halen a couple of times uh, when they performed. The, uh, when I was in college, I did security and they worked at the Rochester War Memorial, which is not there anymore. And they had a writer in their contract, um, you know, for M&Ms. And the M they, can have, they asked for M&Ms, but no green M&Ms. So I was speaking to, uh, I think it was David Lee Roth, and I asked him why. And they said, we if there's no green green M and M's, we know they read the writer. So I, I thought that was interesting, but we don't do any. You know, you know, it's about the performance. You know, so oh, of course, that's a wild story. Why would it be the green M and M's? I don't know. Makes I, no I, sense, I, right? I have no idea. I, it could have been the orange. I don't really right. remember correctly, but um, you know, I used to stand on stage you know, while they, um, while the acts performed and I got to, you know, I got to see a lot of cool acts, but I did, you know, there's a lot that I did that, you know, that people, um, you know, I was a garbage man. I was a limo driver. I was a porter. Um, were you, you ever know. a bouncer? Oh yeah. Are you kidding? With your size? Yeah. The, the, the first time I went to a nightclub, I, and and I, I wasn't the type of guy who went out because I was a real jock at the time. And once I got, um, w once I 
I got done playing football. I went to a nightclub for the first time. And the owner came over to me and he goes, um, uh, would you like a job? And I'm like, um, what kind of job? That's how stupid I was. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, he goes, he goes, well, we've been having some trouble here and we could use a guy your size. And uh, I said, yeah, I said, you know, I went to the club, my friends hang out there. And I said, all right, you're going to pay me. You're going to pay me to come here. I, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to come here and hang out with my friends anyway. Mm -hmm. So uh, I did a lot of that for, you know, for a while. I was, I, I worked the, uh, you know, a lot in the bar business. What were some of the clubs I used to bounce at? Oh, my first club was Peach Trees and Nurse Shell, then Take Five. And um, there was a whole bunch of, you know, then after a while, you know, you know, a night here and a night there and so on and so forth, you know. And then at that point, I um, <clears throat> I basically worked in Westchester. I didn't work in the city. And then after that, I got into uh, one of the guys who um, who owned the nightclub that I worked at, opened up a comedy club and he asked me to... Uh, to be a manager there the rest and is history. that really was the start of the comedy and that was it the rest is history yeah you know and uh when i was in the nightclub uh on saturday night i uh i used to host a dance contest and um you know i would be on the microphone and you know i just do my thing and after uh one night uh, somebody came up to me and says, Hey, uh, have you ever thought about going on the radio? And I'm like, uh, no, I never thought about going on the radio. So he goes, you have a great voice. Your sense of humor would be unbelievable on the radio. So I said, I don't know. What do you want to drink? What's the point of this conversation? You know what I mean? So he goes, no, I work at Z100. Why don't you come down and I'll show you around. He goes, and, and so I would go to Z100 in the 80s uh, in Secaucus, you know, two, three nights a week for three years, never get paid. But I would, you know, I I learned all the formalities of the radio. I started doing voices and characters and, you know, fake phone calls and all that stuff. And I enjoyed doing it, but I never, and and not even in the back of my mind that I think one day I would get paid. And then in 96, there was an audition for KTU. And um, I was the last one uh, to get hired. And um, I wasn't really sure about taking the job. I didn't really, I was doing something else at the time. And the program manager said, look, he goes, uh, this is your life's work. This is what you're supposed to do. He goes, I know you don't have a radio background. He goes, but when you say hello, I hear you on the radio. He goes, I start laughing. He goes, you I, you cannot teach people to respond to you. Uh, he goes, I don't care how much schooling you have, radio experience, and so on and so forth. He goes, but for whatever reason, people respond to your voice and your humor. So I said, okay. I said, give me the Monday. And, um, you know, I went home. And as a rule, I never listened to anybody. Uh, but I felt like this was like a moment of clarity for me. I said, you know what? I don't even know this guy. How can anybody talk like this to me? So I said, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to give it a go. And um, I started at KTU in 96, and I, I left in 2012. So it was, it was a good run. Do you miss doing radio? I miss the people. I miss the connection with the audience. You know, it's it's a totally different brand. You know, you do stand up comedy and you stand in front of the people and you get an immediate reaction. You know, and I mean, it's instant gratification. On radio, like we do the morning show, morning shows have, you know, they'll have a crew of a, a half a dozen to up to 12 people. Like if you have, you know, Elvis Duran has a, a big, you know, a big staff. So we would have like six people in the, in the studio. You know, and I, if I said something funny, I knew that I could make the people that were next to me laugh. But I didn't know if anybody thought, you know, what I said was funny until I went to the gym that night. And I would go to the gym that night and people would come up to me and would say, you know, you said this. I almost drove off the road. And I'm like, really? You thought that was funny? I, that, 
I didn't, I didn't think that was funny at all, but you, you know, you get the response from the people and then you start tailoring your humor to uh, your audience. And, uh, you know, it was interesting. It was, it was a great learning experience. Yeah. We've had David Brody, Scary Jones on with us. I said the same thing that you never know if something hits because you, nobody's there other than just your, your people. No, you don't. You. So it's interesting, but for you, you know, what was your kind of routine? When were you, were you waking up at two o'clock? Like when were you getting to the studio? And then oh, what were you eating for breakfast? Like were you eating at three uh, o'clock? Were you having like, you know, hamburgers at eight o'clock in the morning? What was that morning? No, 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 no. I, I had to be in the studio at 4.30. What would be funny was um, my friends would call me up like at eight, at eight o'clock at, at, at night. You know what I mean? And they would say, Johnny, we're going to go down. Uh, we're going downtown. We're going to we're going to eat in Tribeca. And I'm like, dude, I can't do that. You don't understand. I got to get up at four o'clock. I said, it's eight o'clock. I got a robe on with a with a cup of chamomile tea. I said, I said, I got to I got to get my eyes closed at 10 o'clock. So, yeah, I mean, I had a very strict schedule. Uh, I basically would sleep five hours a night. Uh, you know, get to the studio, you know, you know, before five, you know, then do all the prep up until six o'clock. You know, the producer would give you all the stuff that would uh, we'd be working on. Um, you know, we would polish it together. And, uh, you know, somewhere around seven o'clock, I would order breakfast. You know, and I, I was never, you know, anything, uh, you know, fantastic, you know, bacon, egg and cheese and you know, a cup of coffee or something like that. All right. So you kept basically a normal eating schedule, breakfast, time, lunchtime, dinner time. Yeah. Yeah. My big meal would be in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. You know, I would, I would eat dinner in the afternoon, you know, but it was, it, it, I was so active at the time. I mean, you know, I had the radio from Monday through Friday and I would do, I would probably average about three appearances a week. Yeah, I would imagine everybody was hitting you up at that time. Go, Co- come coast this, come do that, MC this, like nonstop. Yeah, many- yeah, and it and it's weird when you're on the radio because like I would go for, uh, you know, everywhere you go, you know, people, um, you know, uh, can you see me? Oh, uh, you're you're frozen. Hold on one second. Where are you? That's my wife call. So the appearances, what was funny about the appearances or not appearances when you go on the radio, everywhere you go, you know, the station had a cum of over 2 million people. So if I went into a restaurant or, you know, people go, oh, Johnny, blah, 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 you know, and I would talk about things if I used them or if I legitimately liked them. Like, in other words, if I went to a restaurant I would pay so I could legitimately talk about it. But it was the little things. Like if I went into a pizzeria and I got a slice and a soda, the owner would come over. He goes, Goomba Johnny. He goes, I I don't want to charge you. Just mention to me on the radio. And I'm like, well, how much is a slice? And he goes, it's two fifty. I said, how much is a soda? He goes, it's one fifty. I said, that's four dollars. Do you have any idea how much a commercial costs on my station? I said, you don't have to. You'd have to give me a hundred pies before we're even. So I would say, let me pay. You know what I mean? But if I went somewhere and I got a slice of pizza and I thought it was fantastic, I would talk about it or a great burger or, yeah. you know, I had a meal somewhere or, you know, I went on, I went out with friends and we had a really good time. I would, you know, I would pass it along. Did you ever get to send on any, any trips or go hosting places elsewhere? I know like, like Elvis Duran, they're constantly in the yeah. Bahamas and far on a cruise, like every month, it seems like. Yeah, we went everywhere. We went everywhere. We went to uh, one of the best ones was we went to Ireland. Wow. Um, and we flew to Ireland on St. Paddy's Day and broadcast live back to New York, uh, Baltazar and I, from yeah. Dublin, back to New York on St. Paddy's Day. And what was weird was St. Patrick's Day is a lot bigger here than it is in Ireland. Oh, yeah. That I really care. Yeah. yeah. And then they took us on this VIP tour. It was pretty funny. But, um, in Dublin, they have, I think it's called the Guinness Store, where they make Guinness. And um, 
one thing that's interesting about Ireland is the tallest building in Ireland is like 14, 15 stories. Wow. And it's it's not even in Dublin. Everything is village like. It's a very uh it's a very spiritual type country. It's really beautiful. And they took us to this place where they make Guinness. And, you know, they w went to the first floor, the second floor, and they're showing us how it's done and all that. And then we get to the top and they have a bar overlooking downtown Dublin. And they pour the Guinness. There's an art to pouring it. And, uh, and we had the guide and he gave me the, uh, a, a glass of Guinness to try. So he goes, well, Johnny, he goes, how does the Guinness here in Ireland compare to the Guinness in the States? So I said, well, I got to be honest with you. I never had Guinness before. He goes, you're kidding me. He goes, you mean your first glass of Guinness is here in Ireland on St. Paddy's Day. He goes, that's like going out with a Playboy model on your first date. And I'm like, uh, no, it's not. I'm Italian. You guys are way too into your beer here. <laughs> said, that's not a great analogy. <laughs> so... I thought it was pretty funny. Yeah, I was going to say, there's nothing more American than an Italian in Ireland doing the St. Patrick's Day radio show. <laughs> it was pretty funny. It was great. You know, um, you know, we went to the Bahamas. We went to Miami a lot. Um, uh, one time I did the MTV Beach House in California. Um, you know, a, a lot of different places, you know. Um, oh, uh, we went to uh, Vail, Colorado once. I'll never forget. And, uh, and uh, you know, some of, these, some of these trips like Nassau and this Vail, Colorado, we would fly with listeners. You know what I mean? It, it would be a big thing, you know, like, you know, Elvis will go with his crew because Elvis is in like 80 cities. Yeah. So he'll go, he'll go to one of the cities that he's in, you know, and broadcast from there. But we were, um, we, we did a live, they used to call them remotes from Vail, Colorado. And, um, I don't ski, but I was at the bottom of a mountain. And uh, one of the guys goes to me, he goes, hey, uh, you're from back east, huh? So I said, how do you know I'm from back east? He goes, you're the only guy on the mountain with sneakers on. <laughs> I, I just went to Vail to, uh, to party. It was, we had a good time, a lot of laughs. But um, on one of the trips in uh, to... Uh, Nassau, I, I got, I broke five ribs and collapsed my lung in a scooter accident. Oh, geez. Yeah. Got hurt really bad. And, uh. Must be crazy going and going to an uh, international hospital. Well, I'll tell you, um, you know, you get, there's one thing people don't think about. You, you, uh, you go on vacation and you get hurt and you don't understand the quality of care. Yeah. Even the worst hospital here is better than the best hospital there right and uh you know i i, I the, the station started to panic um um because i was in a very very small hospital um they had to puncture my lung to drain the blood out of my lung so on and so forth so the station uh got a private jet um and they weren't able to fly very um uh, very high very low over the water because of my lungs um, I was just laying on a board in a private jet. Uh, they took me to the uh, Jackson Trauma Center in Miami. And I stayed in Miami Hospital for uh, for about four or five days. Wow. It's good that they got you out of there. <laughs> yeah, crazy. no, literally. You know, I, I guess I guess it would have been bad publicity if I died. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> oh, my God, it's so bad. <laughs> You know, um, well, you know, you know, I mean, you know, people do what's in their best interest, right? No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so let's uh, uh, let's get back on track with your your comedy career for a second. Um, so you're also known as a, a master roaster, right? You've done a couple of roasts for some well-known celebrities, uh, stars on Wall Street, right? Um, Vincent Pastore. Uh, known as Big Pussy from The Sopranos, uh, he's a friend of a friend of Nick and I's. Yeah. Uh, Gary Del Body, you know, from the Howard Stern Show. Uh, that creep, Matt Lauer. Matt creep, uh, Matt Lauer. And you know, it was interesting. <laughs> um, they had a contest at the Friars Club, and I won it. 
uh, a national uh, uh, talent search for roasting. And it was a have series. You ever, have you ever been approached to do some of the other big uh, uh, comedy special no. roasts? Specials, no, be, uh, like yeah. golf? No, I, I don't like it. I don't like it. Um, you know, um, I did a roast for a friend. You know, after that, I was asked a couple of times. And I did a roast for a very dear friend of mine with a bunch of other comedians. Um, it was in a comedy club and um, somebody got up and uh, they said something about my wife. And I, from that point on, I just remember saying, after I said to myself, um, this, this guy's dead, all right? I'm gonna punch his nose right through his face. And then I realized, I said, this is not for me. You know what I mean? Because, I mean, you see the roast. They get really, yeah. you know, sometimes they get very personal yeah. and very mean. And I'm like, you know what? I, even though if I may be good at it, this is, this is not the road I want to go down. I, I'm not the type of person that could take uh, those type of, uh, you know, those type of insults, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, family and whatnot. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I mean, don't you, have you watched some of the roast? Have you seen? I I, I sit there and say I don't. Know how, yeah, I don't know how somebody doesn't get out of the seat, and you know. Well, they know what they're getting themselves into. But I also they're, think they're also, also getting think, paid millions of dollars to go. Probably. Yeah, yeah I also no, think well, doing something at Friars is different than a big TV production budget with yeah. well-known people, mainstream people. Right? It's like you got to go. Be, be theatrical go over the top you know you had to like really really twist the knife and you know as opposed to just kind of doing it with your you know your close friends and getting up there for five minutes and telling a couple lighthearted jokes they're two different things yeah it is it is and um you know i guess i don't have the stomach for it you know um you know it's i mean i could do it but um i think sometimes it gets a little bit too personal definitely yeah and, it, and they I mean, cr cross the line and then it's not even funny. Yeah, you know, it, it is. I mean, and, you know, look, I mean, Jeff Ross is, just, uh, you know, Jeff Ross is, you know, just fantastic at it. You know, he's extremely clever. And then some of them, you know, you know, I watched Nikki Glaser. She's unbelievable. She was great. The Tom Brady one. Yeah, she's um, she she's great at all uh, the ones. Kevin Hart was awful. Uh, I think uh, Ben Affleck was the one that that shit the bed. I if think Bill ask. Belichick was great. Is he's Ben Affleck is not used to this. Ben he's Affleck like, was not comedy guy, right? Yeah, you, you know, he, and he was the last one. Ben Affleck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's uh, you know some of the people they put on the roast, like you just look and you say, why is that person there? You know, the, are they just filling a seat, or it's just a name or whatnot? But they're funny. Some some of them are funny. I, I saw the Martha Stewart one. I remember that one. And that was funny. You know. Yeah. I mean, it is what it is. It's look, it's another form of humor. Um, you know, people love it. They have their fans, you know. I, I remember growing up watching the Dean Martin roast. Yeah. And nothing will ever touch those. Yeah, but those were, you know, those were um the, everything on the Dean Martin roast was done in, uh, with a little bit more love. Taste. Yeah. Today, it's like, you know, I'm going to find the underbelly and kick you in it. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And if it was like the Dean Martin roast, I would be more than happy to get involved in it. But, you know, the way it's set up today and it's structured, it's, it doesn't serve right. me. You're better off doing your stand-up shows like you do. At, who you said you mentioned you mentioned before you you're touring with Anthony Rodia now, but who are some of your other favorite comedians to do shows with? And based on your comedy career and the radio stuff, who are some people you've you've met that are celebrities or that came to your show or ended up being big fans of yours? Um, well, you know what? Uh, performing on the radio and performing on the stage is two different things. Um uh, you know, uh, I mean, I would have comedians up every week on KTU, just about. And uh, some of them, you know, 
were very good and some of them were 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 not. It's a different form of comedy. Um, you don't have a lot of time, so you can't fish for a laugh or go into this long bit with just like one or two payoffs, you know, and that was one of the things I was able to do in radio. You, I could do a 30 second, 60 second, 90 second, two minute bit on comedy and then be funny, be in and out and then get into the music. But the two people that stuck out to me that were fantastic on the radio, number one, Dice Clay. He is just unbelievable on the radio. He's hysterical. I think he's funnier on the radio. He's funnier in conversation than he is on stage. And the second would be Jay Moore. Jay Moore is a very, 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 very funny guy in conversation. Um, really hysterical. Very, very good. You know, uh, Dice was fantastic because he was just so unpredictable. Uh, you never knew what was going to come out of him. Uh, but Dice was always great on the radio. I mean, I, all his interviews, um, you know, um, all this uh, Howard Stern or whatever he does. I mean, he just, I mean, just you can't get enough of him on the radio. He's he's that good in conversation. So I want to mention quick before we uh, we start wrapping this up in a little bit. Um, he wrote a book years ago. Yeah. And it's available on Amazon. And I wanted to ask you about the process of trying to translate comedy and that Italian upbringing, right, to paper. Uh, so the book was, so you want to be a mobster, get made, get paid, get babes, start your own mafia family. Uh, there was a comedic the, hand guy on right, how to start your own start, mafia family. Right. Where, where, how did the, the idea come up with that? Do you, do you remember the moment you were like, I'm going to write a book about creating a mafia family? Um, you know, it, it, I, I was approached by the, um, I lost you again. The wife calling you again? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. We're, good, we're good now. We're good now. Yeah, so, we can edit around um, this. What happened was I was approached to write a book, uh, from, uh, Kensington Publishing about dating. And at the time I was in my forties and I was single and they said, we'd like you to write a book about dating. And I'm like, you got the wrong guy. I'm single. I, I'm very unsuccessful in dating. No, no, no. You are the right guy. So I went and I wrote, uh, I wrote an outline in three chapters and I handed it in and I heard nothing from them for six months. So I, I just assumed they didn't like it. And I got a call after six months and they said, yeah, you know, we read what you wrote. And I said, great. Um, what did you think? Well, two things. Um, um, we weren't, um, we think you could write, but we, we don't think that's the right, the right book for you. And I said, well, well, what do you want me to do? I said, we want you to write a comedic hand guide on how to start your own mafia family. And I'm like, oh God. I said, really? I said, are you serious? And uh, um, I said, I'm not going to do that. And then they called me back a week later and, um, you know, they made me an offer and, you know, I decided to do it. And, you couldn't uh, refuse that. No, you know what I mean? <laughs> and to be to be honest with you, I, I did it to see if I could do it, you know, because in high school, I probably would have been voted most likely not to write a book. You know, and so <laughs> what I like about it is sometimes I make people introduce me as an author and, <laughs> and I just get a kick out of it. Ladies and gentlemen, comedian and author, you know what I mean? And people look at me, he wrote a book, he wrote a book. <laughs> right. So, you know, it was fun doing it. And, um, you know, it was more about the accomplishment rather than the book itself. I mean, it, you know, it's it's all done tongue in, tongue in cheek. Absolutely. They gave you the concept, you gave them the blueprint. Yeah, and, and that was basically it. Um, but um, th that was a while ago. I'm, I'm working on a one-man show now um, about my life. I'm, you know, it's kind of going to be the culmination of my career. And... Uh, I'm working on that. I've been working on this for a couple of months. I'm going to put that together and then I'm going to go off Broadway 
and then see how it goes. And, you know, maybe well, something. It worked, out of for, it worked for your buddy Chaz, you know, the, the Bronx tale. So. Well, you know what? Yeah. I, spoke to, I spoke to Chaz and, um, you know, um, you know, I was having I was having a uh, I had a hurdle with doing the one man show. And he invited me to his house and, you know, we had a barbecue and it was just me and him. And he gave me some really, really good advice about going forward with the, um, you know, with the one man show. And he simply explained to me, he says, Johnny, he goes, I know this is going to be difficult. He goes, but if you do your one man show, you have to, you have to expose yourself warts and all. And all the things that happen to you, good or bad, you have to be truthful about your life, including the bad. And then people will understand why you made those decisions. If you just go up there and just do your show and it's not, you're not honest about, about things that are, are difficult to talk about, he goes, um, he goes, the show will never be successful. So um, I dealt with that for a while. And then I reached a point where I said, OK, I'm I'm ready to uh, I'm ready to tell it all. So we'll see what happens. You guys got to come one once I. Uh, once I get it up. Absolutely. I was going to say. Absolutely. Hell you're yeah. You're going to come to a man show or then one of the next times you're doing stand up in New Jersey, New York, Atlanta yeah. City, we'll have to come through and check it out and hang out. Guess who guess who just walked in, my wife? Hey. Podcast going hey. on. Yeah. Yeah, we um when you called. We... I was interrupting. Well, you didn't know everything. The show it, we I lost it went off. Oh. Or you were calling to remind me to do the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no need for that anymore. No. <laughs> it's so funny. My wife is great. I got married at 50. Still hope for Joe. Married. What? There's still hope for Joe if you got married at 50. <laughs> you know, hey, look, oh, boy. How, old you? how old are you, Joe? Uh, I'm 31. Nick and I are the same age. He just turned yeah, 32. So I turned 31 soon. Nick, uh, he got married in 2019, so it's almost five years now. Yeah, um, his wife's amazing. It's great. He's the married one of the two. Um, he's got amazing little boy. He's gonna be one at the end of the summer. Uh, I'm still the single guy, 31. So, no, uh, dude, you got you got 19 years to catch up to me. Do you know right. what it's like being the firstborn in an Italian family? Oh, named boy. after your grandfather, showing up every holiday, younger brothers and sisters married, cousins married, kids, everybody staring at you like, all right, you know. The fuck is wrong with you? Why yeah. aren't you? Yeah. You know, everybody's looking at me. Are you gay? I mean, like, what do you mean am I gay? I, I said, I'm having trouble meeting, I'm having trouble meeting, meeting somebody special. You know, sometimes it ain't in the cards when you're young. I don't know. Sometimes life has something, something's better, right? Yeah, you know. And then one night I was at uh, working at Governor's in uh, in Levittown. My wife was in the audience. I couldn't take my eyes off her, and uh, I ran after her after the show. Um, asked her to lunch, and I got married 14 weeks later. Wow! Wow! Yeah. Oh wait, I think I you use that in your uh, your routine. I think right. Not yeah, I talk, I talk, I talk about that about yeah. what it's like to. Uh, yeah, I remember that. I remember that. Yeah, too. you know, because it it was, um, you know, it was very weird, you know, and you know, all during my forties while I was on the radio, you know, everybody's trying to fix me up. Yeah. You know, and it, what was sounds weird familiar, about, right, Nick? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm going to tell you how it goes. This is what's going to happen to you. People are trying to fix you up. You're in your thirties now and you're going to meet a certain amount of girls that, you know, just got out of a relationship, engaged, so on and so forth. Then you reach your forties, your early forties, and then people approach you and they say, I, I got a nice girl. She's got two kids. You know what I mean? But you know, she came out of a bad divorce. And then as I was getting closer to 50, people were going, Hey, I got a nice girl for you. She has three grandkids. And I'm like, Whoa. <laughs> I'm not looking for a carnation instant family. I said, I want to be, you know what I mean? So the older you get, you know what I mean? It gets, uh, 
you know, the, uh, what's the word? The, uh, the prospect pool uh, gets a little different, you know? But I was fortunate. I met my wife and, uh, you know, I did it and we're still married today. It'll be 18 years in, uh, in October. Wow, so I highly recommend it. Look, dude, I never thought I would get married. And then I reached a point in my life where I said to myself, you know what? I don't want to, I don't want to be alone anymore. You know what I mean? I mean, and I had every reason to be alone. I had an apartment in the city. I had a house in the Hamptons. I had the cars, I had the job, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, for living by myself, I had, uh, you know, financial independence. And then I just said, there's got to be more than this. You know what I mean? Uh, is this, this is, you know, this, this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm shallow how, you know, you know, and then I wanted a relationship. And I wanted to care about somebody. I want somebody to care about me. And I'm sure you feel that way. But um, it'll happen. Yeah. You know, my mother always used to say to me, you don't find love. Love finds you. And uh, and that's, that's what happened to me. And uh, I feel very, very blessed. Yeah. And Joe, once we're doing comedy shows and we're opening for the opener, doing our live show, interviewing guests. Then the ladies will be coming up to you after the show and be like, oh my gosh, what a great interview. You know, Joe, so, you don't have trouble meeting girls. I mean, you're a good I looking don't. guy. I am a good looking guy. I'm well aware. I, I don't have problems right He's now. He's very picky. He's very picky, Johnny, with the, with the, the well, ladies. Well, well, Joe, what do you, Joe, what, what? Oh boy. <laughs> What are you looking for? What just what an ideal girl would he look does, like? If what? she's if she's blonde, she's out. <laughs> He's out. He yeah. like I'm, not a, I'm not a blonde guy now. And he I also he talk, also I, he also reads their zodiac sign and charts to see if I do. Oh, he's into astrology. Yeah, 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 I'm one of those. What? Me too, Joe. What sign are you? Cancer. And what's your rising sign? Scorpio. Okay. Uh, so I'm a I'm a Libra with a Leo rising, you know. My wife's a Gemini. Good but, sign. Uh, he speaks my language. This is yeah. Awesome. Well, I, I got into it. I got into astrology like a couple of years ago, and then when I got into it, I realized what an onion it was. Layers after layer. The mm -hmm. more you 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 start to study it, the more you realize you don't know this thing is this thing is gigantic. Mm -hmm. You know. Because I had a childhood friend of mine that was a psychic. How about that? Yeah. yeah. So his neighbor I, is a medium, I think. She is a medium. She's one of the most well-known mediums in the whole world. Who? Oh. Melissa. Uh, Kubelis. Uh, Kubelis. I'm sorry? Melissa Kubelis. Oh, really? Is she a friend of yours? or My next-door neighbor for 30 years. Oh. Oh, that's very cool because um, I grew up a friend of mine. And let me tell you, this is a funny story because he was... This guy was a, a, this guy partied like, like he was a rock star. And he comes down to the corner one day and he goes, dude, he goes to everybody, he goes, man, he goes, guys, you, uh, you don't know it, man. He goes, I'm starting to see these things in my forehead and they're starting to happen. And everybody goes, okay, bro, you got to stop drinking. <laughs> okay. You got to, you know, no more weed for you. All right. All right. So I walked home with him. I went home with him and I said, hey, what are you seeing? And he goes, I see movies in my forehead. And if they're in black and white, they're the past. And if they're in color, they're the future. And he went on to be a, uh, uh, a psychic uh, business consultant in Japan and the Far East. And he became a millionaire. And he would sit on the board of these companies when they would have their meetings. And he would just sit there. And then he would give the analysis. He was on retainer. Or, or they would bring him new products and he would Pretty tell nice. them. Yeah, it was really bizarre. I wish I had that back. No, I, there, um, there, are, there are certain, everybody has certain intuitive gifts, right? Um, some people can actually remote view. Uh, some people, there there are methods to, to kind of look into past lives too. I don't want to get into that. That's like spooky shit. Yeah, that's, I like never real, that's like really deep occult shit and you can get in trouble for like, no, I never did sharing that stuff out loud. I never did the regression. Kim Russo is a very close friend of mine. Uh, she's a psychic medium. And um, uh, when I was on KTU, we would have 
Psychic Tuesdays. And in the nine o'clock hour, we would give free readings. And we had Von Prague on, Cher, Sylvia Brown, uh, you know, all the psychics that you heard of. And what was interesting, Joe, is that some of them, you know, and I, I, I probably interviewed well over 50. Some of them could tell you your past. Some were good with the present. Some were good with the future. Some were good with relationships. And some were good with business. But only a handful could do it all, hmm. you know, that had that, you know, that had that special thing where they were that well-rounded, where they were psychic, medium, intuitive. And, um, <clears throat> you know, so it, it, I find it very interesting. Joe, it sounds like we need to get Kim Russo on our show. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Kim Russo is, in my, from my experience, is the best medium that I've ever met. Amazing, amazing. The first, my father passed early and, um, you know, she didn't know me. God, this is probably back in the early 2000s after my father died. And I sat down with her and she goes, um, I, I met her at her office and she goes, who's Lorraine? That's all I keep on hearing. I said, that's my mother. He goes, okay, your father's here. And then she went and I felt like I had a 45 minute conversation with my father. And after 15 minutes, I, I was in tears. I mean, all the stuff. And it was so, it was so specific um, to me. You know what I mean? There was no way. I mean, at that time. There was, There's no way that they know this shit. But no, there was know. no Google yeah. back then or anything like that. No. You know, and you're like, how, how did, you know. It, I always think about these people that have that gift. What It must be a real burden to live with it. You know what I mean? How do you shut that off? Yeah, you, you can't, can't just have a normal you can't day. can't do it. You know? You know? But they always tell the jokes, you know, like um, I, uh, somebody told a joke the other day. He goes, well, I went over to some psychic's house and I knocked on the door and they said, who is it? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm not giving you my money. <laughs> What do you mean you don't know who it is? <laughs> really good. Yeah, you know. Oh God, that's really, really but it's, good. It's, you know, I tell you, um, it, it, I'll forward you her information if you want to have her on the podcast. She's a wonderful person. And one thing that I don't know if you know this, Joe, um, this is what I found. Uh, I don't know why it's like this, but Long Island has the best psychic mediums, I think, in the world. And they're like these Italian housewives, Kim Russo, Caputo. Caputo, yeah, Josephine Generelli, uh, Mary Ochino. Something uh, in the water and, out there, Lionel. It's the, I, I was going to say the water. Yeah, it's it's really really weird. There is there is a whole um, a whole bunch of these psychic mediums, these women, these Italian women out in Long Island that are that are just fabulous at it. Really interesting. Absolutely. Please send us uh, her information over. We'd love to have her on. Again, yeah, this, she, stuff, is, this stuff is right up my alley. Over yeah, time, though, two, I think Nick's opening up his mind to it. Yeah, she had two TV shows. She's on a and Yeah. She had, uh, yeah, she she had a, the Haunting show. of and yeah. Psychic inter Intervention. Yeah. Joe, I, I'm not an like, astrology guy, but I'm all about the, you know, the medium and stuff and uh, the psychics. So I'm, I'm, on the, I'm, on, I'm on the boat there. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, and sometimes, uh, you know, um, I met this one woman. Um, she works in restaurants in Westchester. She's a card reader. And my wife and I went to dinner. And um, when we went to dinner, they said, OK, uh, you guys are next. You 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 uh, you know, you get a, a 10 minute reading with this woman. It was some kind of, uh, you know, psychic thing they do, you know, like every this where she shows up and she's in another room. And this woman was remarkable. And I'm like, uh, I told her, I said, Miss, I, I, you don't understand. I interviewed so many of people that do what you do. I said, I don't think you, I, please don't get insulted. I have, you have no idea how good you are, you know? So she goes, no, no, I'm, 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 I'm happy what I'm doing, I'm, I'm fine. But that's a whole, that's a whole nother form, 
you know, and then, the, you know, it, there are people that read your, I, I don't know if Joe, if you are familiar with this, people read your face, Yep. you know, palm readings. I've gone to palm readings before. I have a long lifeline. I'll be, I'll be living into my 80s, so I'll be good when it comes to women. Well, yeah, Joe, um, that's, that's half of it. You're going to live to 80, but what's the quality <laughs> of life? Are you going to be in an iron lung? I'll be fine. I'm not, I'm not too concerned. He's going to be the next Hugh Hefner. <laughs> yeah, they predicted a long life, but did they predict a marriage? Uh, I'll tell you something. Um, I, I have never been the marriage person. Right. And it's just it's a combination of things I believe in and things that I've been through. And it's like I just I've never envisioned myself. Right. Like I just I can't see it. Right. Sharing your and, life. Right. And I guess the feeling you got when you were on stage and you saw your wife and you made that eye contact with her. That was probably the first time you really were like, oh, that's it. Right. You saw everything. <laughs> right. Well, you know, you know, well, when I saw, you know what, everything that happened with my wife and we both agreed, you know, because we got married so quickly, 14 weeks later, we both looked back on it and we're like, I don't know why we did it, because, you know, there was no we, there was no there was no real reason to do it. You know what I mean? Aside from like, this is what we're supposed to do. And it happened so naturally. And, um, you know, it worked out and you know, we ended up. Uh, you know, belonging together, you know, and I, I, and that, that will happen to you too. And, um, just go with it, you know, you know, don't worry. Listen to me. Once you get older, you're going to want somebody. Okay. All right. I do the joke in my act. I'm like, I knew it was time to get married. My back was killing me. I needed somebody to get my prescriptions. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like you get older and you're like, man, I don't, this this whole being alone thing is not, there's got to be more to life than that. You know what I mean? And, you know, at your age, it you don't think about it. You know, you're you're naturally a little selfish in a way. You know what I mean? Not in a bad way, but you think about yourself, take care of yourself. And life is very easy, breezy and so on and so forth. And marriage is very confronting. You know what I mean? You know, it's like, you know, it's like putting a mirror in front of your face like this, this close, like two inches away. You know what I mean? You can't, you, you, who are, you can't avoid seeing what, who you are. And there was a lot of adjustments for me. I mean, I was single very, for a long time, you know what I mean? And I was spoiled, you know, I remember, um, sitting down, I first got married. I grabbed a beer. I put the giant game on and my wife's like, get your coat. I just get my coat for what? The game's going on. We're going to my mother's. Going to your mother's? I'm going to work. And then, then <laughs> lights went off and I'm like, holy shit, I'm married. Mm -hmm. I'm, mess I'm, mess I'm married. You know what I mean? And you have, you know what I mean? And you, you have to be willing to, you know, to give into all that, to share your life with someone. You know what I mean? And that's to me, um, you know, it, it's it'll be difficult for you, you know, because I see a lot of similarities in you and that myself. It's not going to be easy, but it's going to be very, very rewarding. You know what you're doing now, Joe. I feel like a therapist. What you're doing now, Joe, is very easy. You know what I mean? I mean, it's comfortable. I mean, you're just taking care of Joe, you know, and how hard is that? But then when you put another person in an equation and ask Nick when you put a child in the equation, you know, it's a whole, it's a whole different dynamic, but it's very rewarding. So if you're not married by next week, I'm going to be really freaking disappointed. Uh, he's got to find Mrs. Wright by next week. I mean, give him, give him about 14 weeks. If he's not married by give that, him 14 week, weeks, I will see what happens. Nah, he's going to end up, he's going to go to the Philippines and come back with a wife. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 he's that, he's that type oh, of He's going to be a 90 day fiance on TLC. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, like, oh, we're going to get a nice Persian lady and, uh, <laughs> the rest of the history. Oh, boy. I know, I know. I, 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 I do jokes about the Bachelor and the Bachelorette and the Golden Bachelor, which I thought was funny—the senior citizen thing. And that I mean, 
those I'm shows. Pretty sure, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to need the Golden Bachelor. But... No, I don't. I I don't think you will. I think I, you uh, will. I'm gonna. I'm gonna from one younger, handsome Italian man who gets shit from his family to somebody who used to get shit from his family. I will make sure that I will keep you updated on everything. Are, are you personally. are you the oldest in your family? I'm the only one. My mom and dad one. got it right the first time, and they didn't <laughs> last much longer after that. <laughs> Good shit, I, was, I know. It's funny, man. I, I was I was born. Uh, it's funny because I was talking to Colin Quinn today, and we were talking about something. And I was telling him a story about my father because my father was really funny. And I, I asked my father, I said, do you remember the night I was born? And he goes, I'll never forget it. And I said, what do you mean you'll never forget it? He goes, it was New Year's Eve. He goes, I was drunk off my ass. So I said, I, I, how would you say that? He goes, Johnny, you're born in September. He <laughs> goes, can you add? I said, I thought it was like this romantic thing. He goes, no, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. Hey, look, just let it happen. But doesn't, let Nick, you know. doesn't Nick try and talk you into it? All the time. And, uh, Joe's yes. just very selective. So. I'm very well, selective. I'm look, very... Nick, you are, I had four or five, every one of my friends were married. I was the last one who got married. I'm actually like the one of the only ones in our friend group that is married. Nick, I have... And all the guys who get married, all they, all they do is try and talk to single guys into getting married. Yeah, do it. It's good. It's I mean, he, thing he, he should just find us somebody to to date. You know, I'll take it one step at a time. But I think he should he should keep his options open. You know, the third eye. I wouldn't rule out this one because she's a blonde. That one because she's a, a cancer. You know, just if you hit it off, you hit it off and take it from there. Yeah, I mean, do you, Joe? Do you go out? Of course, I do. Do you do any online dating? Joe goes to no, Chinatown. That's, so he's, that's he's not there. for me. Where does he go? Chinatown. Oh, really? No, not to, to, you were to out, go out. You were out in Chinatown my, the other night. At, that's because uh, my Chinatown. father My father lives in the city. My father lives People in the city. People dance on the streets. You were out there. Yeah, I didn't go out or anything. I just went to go get Chinese food with him. Um, no, when I when I go out... Uh, it, so I'm back on Staten Island. I was in Jersey City. I saw a lot of comedy bit. shows. So usually when, when I go out, out with the bachelor either... guys at their DJing gigs. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I'm I'm either out in Manhattan, I'm either out in Hoboken, or I'm either down in Jersey Shore. Those are the, the places I go the most. I mean, you should. Uh, I I don't see you having any trouble. No. At, at all. <laughs> I think I'll be all right. You'll be fine. Just don't uh, don't rule out any possibilities. I mean, if you're into astrology and all the other stuff that we're talking about. Keep an open mind. I mean, you know that. You know, I know you got a plan, but God has a plan too. You know. Yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with the flow type. Nick can attest to that. Yeah. Well, as, I'll leave you with this, as my father would say, "There's an ass for every toilet seat." So <laughs> that's not very romantic. That's what my father no. used to tell me when I was single. There's an ass for every toilet seat. You know. Well, he used to tell he used to tell me he goes why don't you go to the Gap maybe you can meet a girl at the Gap and I said why would I go to the Gap he goes yeah those girls know how to fold <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like that's your I said, that's your fatherly advice so, so anyway it worked out for me so Johnny either in your personal life your dating life or your career. What would you say has been your you know I'm right moment? What I mean by that, it's a time or place where you wanted to pursue something. You asked somebody for advice, which you said you don't right. do. You didn't do you don't do that. You didn't do it with the radio gig. But if you did ask somebody for advice, they told you don't do that. That's a bad idea. And you were like, you know what? I'm gonna do it anyway. And in the end, you'll see why it is that I'm right. Well, you know what? My father I had a very complex relationship with my dad. And um you know, if my dad told me to go left, I went right. Um, I was very rebellious in that way. And my father gave me a lot of great advice that I didn't take. And and when I look back in retrospect, I wish I, you know, if I ever saw my father again, the first thing I would say is I love you. And the second thing I would say is I wish I listened more. You know, because my father really gave me a lot of great advice 
and I was too stubborn or foolish to take it. And I have, I don't want to use the word regrets, but if I can go back and change something, you know, I would change that, you know, and the one thing is, is that, um, you know, like we were talking about with Joe, you have to just, you know, everybody has a gift. Everybody has a blessing. And one thing everybody has in common is not everybody really knows what it is. And um, you have to just keep your eyes and your ears open and become somewhat intuitive to what's going around with you because the opportunities are there. And really, if I had to say what was the key to my success and whatever success I had, um, I was fearless. I was too stupid to be afraid. I tried everything. You know what I mean? And I failed at a lot of things. But, um, you know, I, I I always had the feeling, yeah, I could play football. You know what I mean? I mean, when, when I was in ninth grade, I was the worst guy on the team. You know what I mean? I sat on the bench. You know, then I ended up signing a pro contract. I, 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 I just was not afraid to put myself in a situation, um, you know, where it, it looked like I didn't have very much of a chance, you know. And I always say, um, uh, you know, anybody who betted against me never, never collected a dime. And that's my motto. That's my credo. And I try everything. I'm open to everything. And... <clears throat> You know, if there's something out there and uh, God wants you to have it, nobody can keep you from it. And both of you guys, too. You're going to get what you deserve. You're going to get you're going to go and end up where you're supposed to be. And hopefully you will end up being the person, the best person, the best version of yourself at the end of the day, at the end of your life. You know, I, I started going back when I was 50. I started going to church every day. And since I was, you know, over the past 17 years, I've been going to church every day, you know, 8.30, 8 o'clock, you know, mass. And, and that was a real game changer for me, uh, you know, getting back into uh, having a relationship with Christ. You know, the church, you know, I mean, you could think of a million reasons not to go into the church. I mean, the church has been on the wrong side of a lot of different things throughout the centuries, but it's not about the church. It's about having a relationship with God. And that was very, very important to me. And that made me more accountable to myself, made me more accountable to others, my wife, and it made me more accountable to God and made me a better person. So that, uh, that was probably the, one of the biggest uh, game changes for me personally over the course of my life. But being able to make people laugh um, is fantastic. You know, after the shows, we do meet and greets and people come up to you and say thank you. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, what was really weird about the pandemic was you know, Anthony and I worked through the pandemic. And when we were working during the pandemic and traveling around the country, we would do shows outside, 400 people, six feet apart in a parking lot, um, you know, theaters. We, we do a show in a theater uh, that holds 500 people, only had 100 people. And people would come up to you after the show. And before that, people would come up to you and say, I enjoyed your act. During the pandemic, after the pandemic, people would come up to you and they would grab your hand and they would say, I want to thank you. I haven't laughed in over a year and it would blow you away and you know, the sincerity about it. So being able to make a difference, you know, you guys do what you do, you entertain, you know what I mean? You put stuff out there, you expose people, you have this, this really diversified podcast and you, you pass on knowledge, personalities and all different stuff to people. It's very rewarding. You're doing a great job. You're doing a great service and you're having a great time. So, I mean, it, it's a wonderful thing. You guys, you, you know, what you do, what you guys are doing is great. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, Nick, if between me and you, I'd find a new partner, but that's, 
Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, you know. not the first time I've heard that. <laughs> oh, my God. oh Lord! Come on, Joe. Boy, oh boy, oh boy! I'm always getting the fucking shots, the ricochet shots my way. But I will say, all of that was incredibly well said, John. Thank you for the kind words. Um, you've brought nothing but smiles to people's faces through the years. Whether you know, I used to listen to you and Baltazar on the radio when I was younger on days that my mom used to drive me to school, you know, we would listen for a half hour, all the great comedic stuff that you did, the writing, you know, the phone taps and everything. Right. That amazing, amazing stuff. You brought nothing but smiles to people's faces through the years. You've done an unbelievable amount of charity work through the years at all your stops. Um, so, you know, again, we appreciate all the kind words. Uh, yeah. and like I said, um, I'll definitely keep you updated on my personal life, Nick. And I yeah, will no, keep you updated um, on what's going on with the show. We're gonna come well, see you guys, comedy. Where, where are you guys located? Staten Island. Staten Island. You're in the St. Staten George Italy. Theater anytime. You know, we'll come on down and hang out. Do you know I coined the phrase? I, I'm the first person who started saying Satin Italy. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah, the, the advance gave me credit for it that yes. I coined the phrase. I started saying it on the radio. Yep. You know, um, and I um we're going to be at the St. George Theater uh, later on in the year. So okay. I'd like November, you to come. But we'll hang out. Yeah. I'd like you guys to come as my guest. Thank you. Come watch the show, you know, hang out with me and Anthony, have a few laughs. Now, the question uh, is going to be, will Joe's girlfriend be invited <laughs> if, if he's got a girlfriend at the time? <laughs> <laughs> of course. Thank you. All right, I listen. I'm look. I'm gonna look forward to sharing a, a diet coke with you in the in the green room. And uh, I'm I'm waiting. I'm uh, I'm waiting for like 30 days from now when Nick calls me up. You'll never believe this. Joe <laughs> eloped. He got married in, in the in the Elvis Presley Chapel in Las Vegas. I can't wait to go back to Vegas. Nick Joe knows. loves Las he, Vegas. I fucking love Vegas. He does. He's a gambler. I'm not a gambler. I just he love loves Vegas. the desert. I, he loves the dry heat. Oh, the parties? Well, the, yeah, the, entertainment, parties? the entertainment out there. I have family out there, so it's like, that's for me. The I West, love the, I West love Coast, the I love the West Coast. Right. We, I'll tell you real quickly before we wrap up. I, we, um, we, we had the opportunity to perform at the Venetian. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, uh, on, on two occasions. And I don't know if you ever been to the Venetian. They yeah, have the, that, gond yeah. the gondolas, yep. right? And I'm I'm standing outside. I'm smoking a cigar, and I'm watching the gondolas. And they have these Chinese people in the gondolas. And the guy who's doing the gondolas is Mexican, and he's singing volare <laughs> in, a, in a Mexican <laughs> accent. And I'm like, oh my god, I've seen it all. <laughs> I've seen it all. <laughs> I said, that's not. I said, oh my God in heaven. I said, I said, it doesn't get any more crazier than that. That was so funny. It's Vegas. But I, I look, I, I like Vegas, but after two days, I want to come home. Yeah. I, I just feel like, yeah, three, three, days, just feel like, three days max. You know, I just go, I eat, I eat all the buffets, me and my wife. We go to the buffets and uh, I'm happy after that. So. <laughs> yeah, I went to a couple of shows. I remember going to see, I walked out on Siegfried and Roy. Oh. You ever see that show? Never saw it, no. Yeah. I'm aware of it, obviously, but never seen it. It was the same. It, it was like every two minutes. This, I'm Siegfried. This is Roy. This is the tiger. I'm Siegfried. <laughs> this is Roy. This is the tiger. I'm like, come on. When are you going to do something, man? Like, it's just, you know. And then eventually, I guess the tiger attacked him. Got tired of hearing that shit. Yeah, that was the end of yeah. that. I, I don't know. I think, and I, now I think the Mirage is cl is done. It's closed and it's becoming a. It's uh, closed. Yeah, yeah. It's. Uh, I'll tell you, it, you go to Las Vegas and it's literally an international city. There's people all around the world there, you know. But we work at casinos a lot. You do a we lot of stuff in Atlantic City too, or just well, we only do the Borgata. We'll okay. be there in October first and second. We just recently. Um, You'll like this, Joe. We we recently did um, uh, Mohegan Sun. So my wife likes to go to casinos, right? So I took my wife with me. And uh, my wife walks. I walk very slow. My wife walks fast. So my wife is like 20 feet ahead of me, and she has the key to the room. 
So our room is on the right, but for some reason, my wife went to the left and she's trying to get into the room. It's not our room. And then she, the key doesn't work. And then she's jiggling the door and then the door opens up and there's 10 guys in the room at a bachelor party. And some guy from the back yells out, there's strippers here, there's strippers here. And I'm like, that's my wife. That's my <laughs> wife, it's not the stripper. So the uh -huh. joke is she made $600 and uh, that paid for the rooms. I know it'll be a great show if, we, if there's a night where Goomba Johnny and Anthony perform at the Borgata. Your buddy Blake Hortzman is DJing there. Ah, oh, be perfect for you. All I right, can only do I can only one do one night in AC. That's it. I can't Why? do anything more than that. I'm not an AC fan. I never was. Really? Vegas is different. AC's not. You know what's interesting about AC is that um I found out that it's it's really most of the people come from the Philly area. Yeah, everybody's from Philly. Yeah, if they you go there the in the fall, minutes. if you go there in the fall, all you see is Eagles jerseys. It's sickening. Yeah, and I, I I thought it was supported by basically New York, and that's not no, the case. That's not the case at all. No, no, I, and I I didn't know that. But I mean, I, outside of the Borgata, I mean, I'm I've been to like the Trop. Um, I worked at the Trop, and um, I worked at the Taj Mahal. Nice. Worked at the Taj Mahal. We used to have shows there when Trump owned the KTU. We would have freestyle shows. Yeah. And he would come on stage and say hello to everybody. That was interesting. And that's it, guys. I don't really have anything else to say. That's well, all right. This has this been great. great. We, really. We've enjoyed every moment of it. And we want to thank you for your time. And everybody go check out John's show. I mean, he's no, just, he's you know, check place. me out on Instagram at Goomba Johnny. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you guys, do, are we friends on Instagram? I, I think we I will think, be soon. We will be soon. If we're not, yeah. yeah you better. The great Goomba John. So. Yeah, I've got to keep you updated on everything. Joe's about to go on tour with you guys just to, just to learn from you. <laughs> yeah, nah, he's fine. He's fine. He's he probably won't be able to go on tour because he'll be married. His wife won't let him. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I need. I listen. I need a traveler. That I will say. Yeah. All right. Good. Hey guys. Great time. Continued success. Thank and you. I'm gonna see you real soon. All right. Yes, absolutely. That's gonna do it here for this episode of You Know I'm Right for our very special guest Goomba Johnny, my co-host Joe Calabrese. I'm Nick Durst, and this has been You Know. Ah, all right.